Hello, hello also to St. Louis, and many thanks to the organizers for inviting me for this talk. Um, talking about extremophilus, I would like to get you some aspects of resurrection plants, and I choose one plant which we had a few years ago in our um, research. It was called Merotamnus flabellifolia, a plant coming from South America, uh, from South Africa, and having really interesting um, um, activities. How oh, can I click on green? Ah, here yeah, green. Okay, green is good. Okay, let's have some aspects of uh, resurrection plants. These are in general sessile organisms which can survive under extreme dehydration for long times, which means months to many years. Until now, we know about 240, 250 plants from about 10 plant families coming here from mostly African and South American part of the world. And uh, what is desiccation tolerance? Um, it means we have less than 10% of water related to the um, dry weight. So they are really dry. Desiccation tolerance, which we find in many of these resurrection plants, is not related to senescence. Senescence means the plant is going to die by apoptosis and other processes. Resurrection means it's a state of sleeping and awaking if the water is coming in. This includes downregulation of cellular catabolism, downregulation of uh, uh, cell morphology of cell walls and so on. So it's a very complicated process, but it's reversible. When we look at the 240 plants, we have about 10 families, plant families making such uh, resurrection plants. And in most cases, these are very unusual small families in the plant taxonomy kingdom. Why? Are we going to study resurrection plants? These are extreme fields, and we try to understand uh, how, how, how they uh, keep alive under these harsh conditions. And we should also know uh, to increase our knowledge on a molecular base on uh, these processes, how dry and adverse conditions can be overcome also for the area of uh, crop science and food pro uh, production. And uh, I'm pharmacist and also in the medical area, we try to understand the defense mechanism. If, if you think on a plant which is nearly dead, but it's not dead, uh, it's attacked all the day from microbes, from fungi and from virus, but they are not dead. They, are, they, they do not get infected. What are the defense mechanisms? So are many uh, aspects why to study resurrection plants. Okay, what are the strategies for desiccation tolerance? Let's make this very uh, um, sharply. Uh, we have, for example, lipid lining. Lipid lining means that the, uh, the xylem and also phloems is lined with lipids. So uh, water can stay inside, but not go outside. We have a kind of upregulation of uh, certain tolerance genes. Uh, that alters the osmotic potential of plant tissue for water retention. For example, for Murotamnus, we know uh, a certain cluster of helix loop helix transcription factor families, and these are clusters, gene clusters, which are definitely active in plant growth, defen defense of the plants, and especially when we uh, uh, dehydrate the plants, uh, these clusters get activated, and if you make heterologous expression in Arabidopsis, these Arabidopsis get uh, a high trough and salinity uh, tolerance. So what else uh, we have? We, uh, these resurrection plants, they have also changes in the cell wall architecture. Cell walls are completely changed in a way that they are more uh, heavy, more, uh, they are not breaking, but on the other side, they are getting flexible. This includes arabinogalactan, uh, arabinose polymers protection, uh, changes in the tight junctions, and so on, and so on. Then we know that uh, um, unsaturated phospholipids are produced more and more to uh, increase membrane fluidity. And then, of course, we have also replacement of water by carbohydrates, Pauline, polyphenols, glycerol. So there are many aspects how plants uh, go for resurrection uh, strategy. 
Especially Osmo protection uh, by these plants is interesting. That means the production, the biosynthesis of um, um, so-called compatible solutes, which uh, replace water in case of water removal by interaction with polar growth of the protein surface. Compatible uh, um, solutes, they stabilize membrane functionality, they stabilize protein functionality, and uh, this in a reversible manner. Typical compatible solutes we find in many of these resurrection plants are trehalose, saccharose, glucosyl, glycerol, fructans, and uh, betaines, and uh, all this stuff. Other desiccation tolerance comp uh, uh, strategies are vitrification. This is very interesting. This means uh, increase in certain carbohydrates, which form glass-like materials inside the cells to protect cell organi uh, organelles from damage. Vitrification, kind of crystallization of compounds around the organelles. We have also strategy to protect chlorophyll the chloroplasts, for example, they are protected during the desiccation process by uh, colored pigments, which uh, shed, in principle, the chloroplasts by high light, so they produce do, they do not anymore produce starch. On the other side, we have also uh, uh, changes in the energy production in a way that not starch or glucose is produced, but other compounds which are used, for example, for these osmotic uh, things. And then, of course, this is now getting uh, uh, interesting in the natural product area. Um, the plants change the metabolism to the production of uh, defense strategies, and these are compounds which uh, convert, uh, for example, UV irritation to heat, which are sun blockers, which are antiviral, which are antimicrobial components, and uh, 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 some, some other stuff. And then we know also the morphology of the plant can change very dramatically. Here, for example, from Erotamnus flavellifolia, um, uh, the, the leaves, the leaves are like that, open leaves. And if you dehydrate them, uh, within a few minutes, 30 minutes, they can go down to very linear things. This is, for example, uh, some pictures here um, uh, in, in, in a three minute uh, uh, imaging system, and they just close. And after one hour, you see they are getting red because uh, uh, certain compounds are produced, which, pro uh, which protect the chloroplasts from uh, synthesis. A further strategy is a, a production, the biosynthesis of polyphenols. These are in principle, uh, highly active UV protectant agents. For example, cyanidine 3 o glucosate androcyanidine is, uh, uh, is increased strongly after yeah, one or two hours after desiccation. And this is UV protection and antioxidative potential. So we have many strategies of the plants how to protect how to survive under these harsh conditions. And uh, we can change in this resurrection plan from hydrated status to the dry status with a completely different um, anatomy and also physiology and the cytology uh, uh, can be different from the hydrated state. So let's come to my favorite plant, Merotamnus flabellifolia. This is a plant from South, South Africa. You find it also in Namibia. Uh, it's a mountain plant and it's about two to three meters. Uh, it's uh, green, of course, but uh, if uh, is it in a dry area, uh, it can go into the sleeping uh, status. It can stay three, four, five, six years sleeping, doing nothing, but it's not going to get composed or going dead. It just stays and then in these uh, areas, in these arid areas, if it rains after four or five hours, it can get green and the seed formation, uh, the flowering will start immediately. Seeds will be formed and then after seeding, the plant will die very rapidly, but the seeds will grow up to a new one. So these kind of plants are paradise for natural product chemists. 
because they produce so many un um, usual compounds more for protecting for changing uh, f uh, cell physiology and uh, the, the different compound classes we can find here for example in this mirutamnus are volatile oils arbutin quinic acids flavonoids androcyanidins proandrocyanidins and so on and uh, i have shown you here a, a fractionation scheme i did with some of my co-workers and we found some really interesting uh, compounds and many new compounds never described before one of the major groups had been tannin like proandrocyanidins which are um, uh, derivatives from flavonoids, which are derived from flavane three oils monomers, which are getting oligomerized, polymerized to dimers, trimers, polymers, and so on. And they can be uh, uh, substituted at different positions with uh, very unusual substituents. So these uh, compounds are tannin-like polyphenols, at least at uh, the trimeric levels, they start to have protein denaturing uh, activity. We know from literature, abutin has been always described for um, um, for, for merotamnus. Uh, we found also uh, degaloylated compounds, which are uh, extremely uh, antimicrobial. We find also pentagaloyl glucose, which is a typical tannin coming also uh, from other uh, uh, plants we know in the in the medical area, but it's quite a stringent and uh, antimicrobial compound. Uh, we find uh, uh, huge amounts of this osmotic pressure uh, with compatible solutes, raffinose, dachyose, trehalose, and about four to five percent of trehalose is quite a lot. And this says uh, this is a resurrection plant using this as a compatible uh, solute. Then we started into a, a new class of compounds, which was quite interesting. Uh, they, 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 they are sugar derivatives. For example, uh, glucose you have here as a, as a core molecule. Uh, on the left, it's, it's circled in, in blue. And this uh, um, glucose uh, might be substituted at position three with a gallic, gallic acid and with a hexahydroxydiphenolic acid moiety. Uh, which again comes from dimerization of gallic acid. So this was a three galloyl uh, compound. We have also the two three degaloylated, the one two, the one three galloylated. So uh, it is really fun to analyze this. And you see these are uh, uh, a kind of uh, biosynthesis these plants do, which is uh, randomized. So you can find quite a lot of uh, really nice compounds or here this compound is uh, the maximum you can substitute at a, at a glucose at all. But this was not the end. We found one of the compounds which took me off a year to get the structure is myrodigamine never described before. Um, to understand it, uh, the C50 or C60 compound, um, uh, it, it's terrible to analyze the C13 NMR, you, you, you get crazy for that. Actually, this is a, a glucose substituted at position two uh, and one with uh, galloyl residues, and then substituted with hexahydroxydiphenyl residues, and you get this also dimerized. And we found one more of these terrible compounds, which uh, was similar, but was also a new compound. So it's really fantastic what you what you can find uh, and uh, um, nice compounds in not so high amount, but in, in most cases they are quite uh, strongly antimicrobial active. Or we found quite uh, some galloyl quinic acids. Uh, also in most cases they are galloylated. Uh, for this plant. Okay, now we have a plant with many compounds and we as pharmacists, we also ask if we want to use later on the extract, we have to standardize this extract because these terrible complicated things, they need to be uh, uh, standardized for, um, uh, for, for using it in products or in clinical studies or whatever. And the next thing is to define specification. What is a good material? What is a bad material? What uh, is a good method? What is a method which we can validate? What are lead compounds? And we did that also using seven different of these uh, isolated compounds. And so we can describe the plant in more or less total uh, concerning uh, quality, doing also specification, analytical characterization, and quality control. 
Okay, let's come to the next question. Now we understand a little bit the plan from the chemistry, uh, but can we use this plan for, can it be used? Can we make a product out of it? Can we find some interesting uh, activities? And we go back to the traditional African medicine in South, Amer uh, South Africa and also in Namibia. And uh, it is quite well documented that the indigent people, they use it for cough, flu, wound healing, for asthma, for smoking, and also for uh, gingivitis, which means uh, in inflammation in the mouth. Can this be rationalized? We started two projects, and uh, one was the first, uh, this was antiviral activity, because the idea was if such a plant survives, does it have antiviral effect? Yes, we can say it has a very strong antiviral effect. And we used um, uh, herpes simplex virus type one. Actually, we are working at the moment also with coronavirus. Uh, it's very similar, but um, herpes simplex virus uh, is an old story. And what we found was quite a, um, an, an interesting um, anti-HSV-1 activity in this um, the figure here, you have um, uh, two, two activities. Uh, the black bars represent, in principle, the activity, the cell viability of host cells we use, which are human or, or animal host cells. So that means over the concentration, the vitality stays more or less constant until about 25, 50 microgram per milliliter. Then the vitality goes down, which means there's a certain amount, a certain kind of uh, cytotoxicity at this um, concentration level. And the white bars are the antiviral activity, which means uh, we have here at 0.1 microgram no antiviral activity, but if you go up to about one microgram, you have a hundred percent inhibition of uh, infection of the cells in the virus in, in the black assay. Uh, from this data, we can calculate an IC50 of about 0.4 microgram per milliliter for antiviral activity, which is quite good. And we have a CC50, which represents a toxicity of about 50. And from that, we can calculate selectivity, which is IC50 to um, uh, CC50, no CC50 to IC50 of about 120, which means this is a, a quite good selectivity. If we make staining uh, of the virus in red with a fluorescence, with a, with a stained antibody, we can see in infected uh, viral cells, for example, which are stained in blue, that in the upper uh, uh, figure uh, you have um, strong adhesion of the uh, red virus to the um, to the cells, to the host cells. If we treat with uh, quite low concentration, there is no adhesion, no infection of the cells anymore. And from these data and also from some others I do not show, we uh, think that the uh, extract of Merotamnus interacts definitely with the attachment of the cells. Cells are not recognized anymore by the virus. We call that entry blocker. Okay, I skipped these data. Uh, we, we had been on the search for, for the active compound and we can um, uh, definitely uh, tell one, one compound which is active for this um, activity. Uh, but we, we had been interesting, what, what is the mechanism behind? Um, if we look for the attachment and the first interaction of the host cell with the virus, uh, we have four glycoproteins on the um, on the surface of um, the herpes virus, which are called glycoprotein B, C, D, H, which interact at the first recognition stage with uh, uh, complementary receptor systems, mostly heparans and nectines on the host cell side. We have a, in a first interaction initial at attachment of GB with uh, heparan, followed then by GD attachment to nectin, and then the membranes are brought together, the membrane of the virus, the membrane of the host cell, and then uh, a membrane fusion occurs, and then uh, uh, the, um, the, the virus particle is internalized into the cell. If we investigate the interaction of the D protein, glycoprotein D from the, um, from the uh, virus, together with uh, defined compounds of uh, uh, the mirror extract, we find that in 
a certain concentration and after a certain time this GD protein is inactivated by oligomerization. This, you can see this in this figure that in lane 7 and 8 suddenly uh, the molecular weight of uh, GD is doubling and tripling. That means we have a kind of uh, a crossing uh, and uh, probably covalent interaction of different uh, proteins and they are not active anymore. Um, we did these experiments not only in cell culture, but also in skin uh, uh, equivalents, which are epidermal, dermal uh, systems, a little bit uh, organotypic uh, skin equivalents. And also there we see a, a quite strong reduction of viral load, uh, which is uh, quite nice. And uh, so we are at the end of this story. Uh, so we have the idea that Merutamnus really protects themselves by a strong antiviral effect, which is related to anti-adhesive compounds, which, inter which block the entry and the first, the initial interaction of, the of, of different viruses with the host cell. We had also um, a second um, traditional use of this plant by the uh, African people and the healers used for gingivitis. And we went uh, into a project which investigates periodontitis. And periodontitis is one of the most awful but widespread uh, um, uh, health uh, problems in our mouth area in our Western world. Um, uh, periodontitis has a quite high economic impact of about 30 million euros per year only for Germany. Uh, we have uh, in principle a strong inflammation of uh, the mouth uh, starting with gingivitis and then going into the periodontont and, and uh, at the end you have a loss of teeth and uh, it's a, not a very nice um, uh, disease. About uh, 25 percent of the German population are related to this disease in a strong way and about uh, 50 percent are on the way periodontitis uh, in the mouse in a, a more uh, in, a, in a less severe uh, case. If we uh, look at this uh, infection, uh, we have some keystone pathogens in the um, oral microbiome. We have the good ones here green, we have the bad ones, uh, the red ones. Um, we have the yellow something in between and especially this red complex defined by the existence of Porphyromonas, Gingivalis, Tanarella and Treponema species. This is called the red complex and in case of periodontitis this red complex is getting more and more dominant. We focused a little bit on Porphyromonas gingivalis, which is really a bad bug, um, uh, having fimbria, hemagglutinins, uh, doing strong invasion, capsule, uh, immunological problems. And uh, one of the main um, um, uh, virulence factors of Porphyromonas are the gingi pains, because these are uh, on the fimbria located proteases, which have two functions. The first function is uh, to recognize proteins on the host cells. If this recognition is good, then the bug starts to uh, interact uh, and to stick to the uh, host cell. And the next step is the activation of the protease activity, which means uh, the protein he has recognized is just eaten up. And this is uh, 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 the first step to get into the cell. And the second step is, of course, to get nutrition for uh, the porphyromonas. So we focused a little Oops, we focused a little bit on these uh, 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 compounds from Merotamnus, which are uh, adhesion blockers of Porphyromonas gingivalis, and they are a very strong uh, um, uh, gingipine protease inhibitors. This is quite interesting. I show you some data in FAST. Uh, uh, the, the first left is uh, the Merotamnus extract inhibits the bacterial adhesion to host cells in a concentration dependent manner. So um, uh, the, the bug does not recognize any more uh, human buccal cells. More interesting is that the extract inhibits, inhibits the activity of this proteases. Uh, we have two different proteases, the arginine and the lysine specific uh, gingipines, and uh, more or less the arginine uh, gingipine is inhibited very strongly, the lysine also, but not as strong as the arginine. So we have a certain uh, degree of specificity. 
We could also show that the inflammation parameters uh, by the extract uh, produced by infection uh, of cells with um, perihormonas reduced significantly. So it's not only that we uh, change the interaction, the host pathogen interaction, we, do, we change also the proteolytic activity of the bug and we change also the inflammation response of the cell by the extract, which is quite interesting. So we went also further on which compounds are responsible for this effect and uh, because we did not have at this time so much material from Merotamnus because of some problems with uh, South um, Africa, we used another plant, Rumex acetosa, which is very common from us uh, in our area. And Rumex acetosa is funny, it contains more or less in, uh, similar compounds as Merotamnus in the area of this uh, proandocyanidine. So we use this Rumex for isolation of the compounds. Uh, and we isolated here uh, uh, quite a lot, if I think 20 of these proandocyanidines, and we tested them against porphyromonas and also against these chinchipines. And it was interesting to found that some of these compounds were completely inactive, high bar, others are not so, uh, are, are very good low bars. And if we uh, uh, checked what compounds are active, we can make the uh, 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 structure activity quite nicely. Um, if we have uh, flavane trioles, which are galloylated at position three with a gallic acid, then we have a good effect. Independent, is it a monomer, dimer, or trimer, or whatever, but we need a certain structural element, uh, which is um, uh, very easy to achieve and to, uh, to isolate from this plant. We did also using some uh, chemical compounds uh, um, and, and some in silico docking, and we used one uh, lead compound, which is a dimeric procyanidine, which is, di um, 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 which is um, uh, galloylated in position three, and we uh, docked this into uh, one of these chinchipines, and it was interesting to see that the galloy moiety uh, definitely went into the pocket, into the active center. If we leave out the galloyl residue, then it will not fit anymore into the enzyme. So we understood a little bit what's going on. So we tested also this uh, uh, material in a, in a pilot study, in a clinical study with uh, um, um, uh, 35 patients, I make that very short, and uh, actually we did monitor the amount of bacteria in the mouse, especially the prophyromonas, and it did not change, at least not significant. But what was interesting, we had strong activities on the significant activities on um, uh, inflammation parameters, a plaque index, which was told us by uh, a dentist, this is one of the most interesting things, uh, that the plaque reduction uh, uh, was significant, and we had also less bleeding, significant less bleeding uh, using uh, this mouthwash. But this was also a, a, only a, a small pilot study just to see um, if we can rationalize these effects uh, which had been told by traditional healers from South Africa to us. But at this point of view, we can say, yes, the traditional medicine has teached us to use these plants, which has been used for thousands of years in South Africa for many things. And we have the feeling, yes, it's antiviral. Yes, it's good against uh, these mouse uh, problems. And I think there's a big potential uh, to uh, use these plants or other resurrection plants for uh, uh, interesting medical pharmaceutical uh, applications. So thank you for your attention. And uh, my last slide, I, I always have herbal medicinal products and drugs from nature and natural products from nature. They are absolutely exciting, absolutely fascinating. They are modern, they are innovative, but we have to work for uh, getting them fit for future, but I think there's a big potential uh, in using plants uh, for our health problems. Thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you, Andreas. Uh, really a great talk. Many thanks. It was fascinating to go to this uh, exotic environment 
it was fascinating to leave the comfort zone and thank you Mirko Moroni and Noam Eckstein Levy to make this proposal to go this way. And I would like now to ask the auditory for questions. Hi, thank you. It was a great talk. So um, I had with your resurrection plant extract. So you mentioned that it's also used for wound healing applications. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder whether you think this is due to the anti-inflammatory activities it may have, or does it have any effect on particular stages of wound healing, for example, keratinocyte migration or formation of biofibrillas? We did not check this in our experiments with using this plant, but the wound healing aspects, uh, aspects, I would say, they can be rationalized because we have a lot of tannins uh, inside the plant. We have antimicrobial activity. We have also um, denaturing activity against proteins, which just contract the wounds. So I would say yes. Uh, it would make sense for me, but it has to be proven. On the other side, we know from very similar uh, gallo-related proandrocyanidins, these are again studies we did uh, 15 years ago, also patented, that these compounds have a strong influence on um, the carotinocyte uh, differentiation from the undifferentiated proliferating, proliferating uh, cell status to the differentiating barrier function. And this is triggered by um, three O gallo-related uh, proandrocyanidines, which we again find here also in this plant. So I, I would say, yes, I would go into the experiments with a very good feeling. Wound healing should be uh, possible. Any other question here on site? Yes, please. Uh, Thank you for this fascinating talk. If I understood you correctly, you said like that these plants can go uh, through years of, of dehydration and then within yeah. one day after rain, it, they revive and yeah. can form seeds, but then they die. Yeah. So I was wondering, does it mean there are certain processes which are irreversible or are there examples where there are multiple uh, periods of dryness and, and the plants start growing roots and uh, branches and new leaves? This is a good question. I don't know if uh, if you can rehydrate a meritamnus several times. I, as far as I know, if you use, for example, Rosofiero, the they can be hydrated more than one time. Uh, in our lab, when we had um, uh, plants from from meritamnus, we hydrated them only once, and the second time after trying down, it did not work. But this had been lab plants. I'm, I'm not sure how it really works if you if you are in, in 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 the nature. I would say one time yes, second time the seeds have to grow for a new plant. Thanks so much. And now I would like to ask uh, the colleagues in St. Louis whether there is also a question. Hello. 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 This is Nick Overlays from uh, UNC Greensboro. I really enjoyed your talk. My question was, um, in the in vivo study, I think you said you used a mouthwash, but I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you delivered the extract. And then my second question was, if you're going to do a larger in vivo study, is there enough of the plant out there in the wild, or are you going to have to figure out ways to harvest that to, you know, to make it go through this process? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Th thank you for this great question. Um, first of all, the pilot study we did uh, was not done with Merutamnus, but as you may have uh, realized, we used this other plant, Cummins or Rail, which is uh, very similar to Merutamnus, but it's not a resurrection plant. The reason why we used this plant is that the availability of the Merutamnus at this time when we made the study uh, was a little bit difficult and we needed really many kilograms for this preparation of the uh, mouthwash that we decided to use this other plant. This, from, from the formal point, uh, it, it's a different uh, study. So I, I, I did not tell you really the 100% truth, but um, um, it, it, it's, it's very similar. The second question is uh, how we prepared the, uh, uh, the mouthwash. Um, we did a, a, a very special extraction, so it was done by acetone water. 
73 and we defatted also this extract uh, to get out of the chlorophyll which increases stability of this formulation and the formulation then was stabilized by ascorbic acid and, and um, other things and we had also makes the placebo formulations to, to, to get the same taste or so. Um, these data have been published in Planta Medica um, uh, and uh, the mouthwash contained 0.8 percent of the extract, which is quite, quite concentrated. So it's a very heavy uh, tasting uh, preparation, but at least from 35 patients, uh, nobody complained after three days anymore. And most people said, yes, it's strong. It's like fisherman friends or something like that, but, uh, but it's tasty. So uh, the mouthwash was used in this study, I think seven days every day, two times or so in the evening and the morning. And our idea is if we make a product development, we would like to put it in a mouthwash or in the toothpaste uh, uh, for, uh, um, uh, for, for adding it to an al already existing um, treatment we do every day just by brushing our uh, teeth. So we should, in, from my point of view, we should not make an add-on uh, uh, second mouse wash we have to buy and to use in the morning, nobody will do that, but to add that to the normal toothbrush. But this is industrial thing and marketing, I don't care for that. 